Welcome to our latest talk on medieval graffiti inscriptions in English churches. Uh, this talk is entitled Medieval Graffiti and Emerging Archive and my name is Matthew Champion. The recording of historic graffiti inscriptions really isn't anything new. Um, the earliest reference I've come across so far uh, actually dates back to the 14th century when the German pilgrim uh, Wilhelm von Boldensell uh, recorded Roman graffiti on the pyramids in Egypt. However, um, things have changed greatly in the last couple of decades. And for the most part, this is down to emerging technology, in particular, the advent of digital photography. It now means that um, entire collections of graffiti inscriptions can be recorded um, cheaply and um, without a great deal of um, time or effort being put in. Um, a lot of these projects have been really what we call citizen science or community archaeology projects. Uh, one of the largest and one of the earliest was the Norfolk and Suffolk Medieval Graffiti Survey, um, which recorded inscriptions in over 650 medieval churches. When we began the surveys, we didn't really expect to find too much. Um, we were anticipating perhaps a few thousand inscriptions. However, the more we looked, the more we found. And we soon discovered that the walls of our medieval churches were absolutely covered in early inscriptions. Now, um, a lot of these examples are obviously post-Reformation, as you can see from the examples there on the right of the screen from Sedgeford in Norfolk, but a lot of them certainly date back to the medieval period. Um, in, in Norfolk and Suffolk alone, we recorded over 70,000 individual inscriptions. So uh, it really is a whole new emerging archive. So why study graffiti? Well, today graffiti is generally regarded as something that's antisocial, something that's destructive, um, fairly akin to vandalism. Um, however, that really is a fairly modern concept. It only starts turning up really in the middle of the 19th century. And prior to that, um, leaving your mark or leaving your name or anything else inscribed into a historic building, be it a church, cathedral, or you know, even an ancient monument, people really don't seem to have had much of a problem with it. And the reason we know this is we've actually got written evidence. Um, one of my favorites is a court case that dates back to the 15th century from an island in the Mediterranean. And I'll quickly um, cover this for you. On the 2nd of September, 1486, an accusation was made in front of a vicar on the Maltese island of Gozo against the cleric Andreas de Visconis by the husband and the father of local woman Jacobi Salaby. Visconis, they claimed, had sexually harassed Jacobi Salaby while she was at prayer in the church of St. James. Now, this court case is absolutely wonderful. First of all, there is um, the cleric Bisconis's defense. Uh, he claims it was a case of mistaken identity. Uh, in the dark interior of the church, he claims he mistook Jacoby Salaby for a prostitute of his acquaintance. So that makes it perfectly OK then. However, witnesses were brought against him two individuals who claimed they had seen uh, graffiti inscriptions on the inside of the church. Graffiti that had been created by Andreas de Bisconis, detailing exactly what he'd like to do to Jacoby Salaby. Now, um, he was actually found guilty and he spent two years in chains for his sins here. But what's particularly interesting about the case is the references to the graffiti on the walls of the church. It's very clear that the um, Andreas de Bresconis's graffiti was not the only graffiti present and um, that the judge and the jury had absolutely no problems with the graffiti itself. It was only the content of the graffiti. So it appears from um, this and many other references that graffiti really wasn't frowned upon in the way that we would frown upon it perhaps today. In the Middle Ages in particular, um, as we'll see this evening, uh, the creation of graffiti inscriptions in churches seems to have been both accepted and acceptable. So what can we learn 
from these early graffiti inscriptions? Well, if you wander into one of our many thousands of surviving medieval churches here in England and look around you, you know, you look at the stained glass, the alabaster monuments, the brasses on the floor, just about everything you are looking at relates to the elite. It re relates to the top five or ten percent of medieval society. So where then are the other people? Where then are the commoners? Where are the other 90% of medieval um, society? Well, as any historian will tell you, they do turn up occasionally. Um, they turn up in the old manor court role, they turn up in the old will, they turn up in the old legal document. But those really tend to be sort of atypical documents. They really only represent when those individuals come into contact with authority. And they don't represent their everyday interactions with the medieval church as either a building or an institution. Now, the wonderful thing about the medieval graffiti, of course, is it has the potential to have been created by anyone and everyone. Everyone from the Lord of the Manor and the parish priest all the way down to the lowliest peasant. And as any historian will tell you, there aren't too many areas of medieval studies where you get this entire cross section of society. So for me, that really is the attraction. It's opening up an entirely new window into the hopes, the fears, the dreams of a large part of the population who are normally within the record silent. So what are we finding? Well, <laughs> to be honest, just about everything you can possibly imagine. Um, everything from carved animals, heraldry, memorials, religious inscriptions, text, names, dates, um, just about everything across the entire spectrum of the medieval world. Now, <laughs> a lot of the imagery we're finding on the walls of our churches tends to be religious or devotional in nature. And quite a lot of that is fairly orthodox, as these examples before you will show. Um, the largest image here we have is from Houghton in uh, Hampshire, and it appears to be a Trinity symbol, um, still used widely in the, in the church today. This particular design appears to be a setting out scheme for uh, a later wall painting. Uh, the wall painting, of course, has now been lost, but we can still understand exactly what was there from the inscribed lines in the fabric. On the top right, we have a rather wonderful, um, deeply carved inscription from Sawston in Cambridgeshire, um, which simply reads, Misere me Deus, may God have mercy upon me. And then at the bottom there from Worlington in Suffolk, we have um, an inscription which we've now discovered in quite a few churches, where you have a hand raised in blessing. This one is inscribed at about shoulder level, just as you go into one of the side chapels there. And it's almost as though the graffiti is offering you its blessing as you enter that small area. Now, some of the inscriptions we come across, it's really quite difficult to even talk about them as being graffiti. They certainly cross a few boundaries, such as this rather um, magnificent example from Norwich Castle Keep. Here you can see the inscription is very, very deeply cut into the stonework. And it almost borders on the formal decoration that you would see carved into your average church. However, this has definitely been done informally. Um, you've got three figures there. On the left, you have um, the Virgin and Child. In the center, you have St. Catherine holding up the Catherine wheel. And on the right, you have a very heavily eroded St. Christopher, and you can just make out the Christ child on his shoulder. So really a lot of these inscriptions come close to crossing over these boundaries. It really is a gray area. When, when is graffiti graffiti? And when does it start becoming actual sculpture? Now, although a lot of the imagery is orthodox, um, anywhere between a quarter and a third of the imagery we come across in our medieval churches is slightly different. These are what we call apotropaic images also referred to as ritual protection marks, or as they're still referred to today in some regions of the Baltic, as holy signs. 
An apotropaic mark is essentially a mark which is designed to ward off evil. It's designed to offer some level of protection. Um, it can be any form of evil, be it demons, witches, or the evil eye. But these offer some form of spiritual and physical protection to an area or an individual. The one thing we don't call these is witch marks, despite what you might read in the media. A witch mark is actually the, uh, the, the mark on the body of a witch, um, which was the physical manifestation of her compact with the devil. However, a few years ago, a journalist got hold of the idea that these marks on the walls were witch marks, and it seems to have stuck. If anything, these can be described as anti-witch marks and they certainly take a great many forms. You have everything from the pentangle, the pelter, um, Merrill's designs to these compass drawn six petal rosettes to the conjoined V symbol. The chances are if you go into a church and it has any surviving early graffiti then at least one uh, if not many of these symbols will be present. One of the most common uh, is the six petal rosette design, also sometimes um, misreferred to as the daisy wheel or the hex foil or hexafoil. Um, this particularly lovely example is from Worlington Church in Suffolk. And you can see here that you have your typical six petal rosette, which has actually then got a whole series of concentric circles across it. These compass drawn designs come in many shapes and sizes. Some can just be a simple compass drawn circle. Other ones can be uh, more elaborate as you see here, or even more elaborate still as multiple, um, multiple you know, geometric designs. Now, a lot of this symbolism comes straight out of the medieval church. You'll find this same design being used on fonts. You'll be, find it being used as consecration crosses. You'll find it being used on grave slabs. And in the case of the six petal rosette, it's often used as an alternative or a replacement for the cross or crucifix. So a lot of these apotropaic symbols are really um, just an extension of the imagery and the uh, devotional markings that we'd find elsewhere in the medieval church. However, we do sometimes come across what people might term the magic on the walls. It is rare, um, but actually to find symbols which are related to uh, you know, concepts of formal magic, um, such as this Rotas square from Alphamstone in Essex, um, you know, they, the church walls are clearly being used for um, things going beyond what we might think of as typical devotional activities. Some of the most startling we've come across are those in Norwich Cathedral, where um, the Norfolk Survey actually carried out a large scale study taking a number of years. And here we actually identified several medieval curses which had been inscribed into the fabric of the building. Now that may surprise some people to find curses actually inscribed into a religious building. But what you have to remember is that the medieval church is a very different church from the one we know today. The medieval church was actually really quite into cursing people. Um, it had a ceremony once a year where they actually read out a list of curses. Cursed be he who moves his neighbor's boundary stone, etc, etc. Um, and of course, the great curse, as it was known, was excommunication, disassociation from the formal church um, in its entirety. So uh, although these inscriptions may seem uh, unseemly today, uh, these are simply another aspect of the medieval church. So what else are we coming across beyond our devotional and religious inscriptions? Well, the one that most people really get excited about are the text inscriptions. However, text is really quite rare. It only makes up between about 5 and 10% of all the inscriptions we come across. Now, these are three of um, my particular favourite examples. Um, the one at the top left is again from Troston, uh, just over the border into Suffolk. And it reads, uh, Yohed or Johannes or John Abthorpe. Now, what's wonderful about this inscription is that we can actually tie it into the written record. 
we know that the Abthorpe family were lords of the manor in Troston from the beginning of the 15th century all the way through to about 1490 when the male line died out. And we have a John Abthorpe who is actually a witness to a number of local wills, particularly in the, 15, uh, in the 1450s and 1460s. Now, is this the same John Abthorpe? Um, is this the Lord of the Manor leaving his name inscribed into the Tower Arch at Troston? Well, it's difficult to say. The text is certainly from the mid 15th century, but as with all these uh, inscriptions, we have to take an archeological and a cautious approach. Just because we have the name John Abthorpe doesn't mean it was written by him. It could have been written by any other literate person in there. We could, in fact, be missing the rest of the inscription, which you know, may have read John Abthorpe is a git. We simply don't know. So the rule of thumb with all of these is we take a very archaeological approach. So um, while we have his name there, it may not be him um, actually creating it. On the top right, we have a rather lovely example from Great Bardfield down into Essex, and it actually reads Framlingham. Um, in this case, it's probably not referring to the rather lovely market town of Framlingham, but it appears to be the rector of the parish, again from the late 15th century. And what's particularly nice about this example, as you can see, is it's been decorated. So you've got the little flower in the centre, you've got the wonderful sort of illuminated capital. It's almost been um, decorated to look like it came straight from a medieval manuscript. So this is clearly created by someone who is very used to the writing arts. It's clearly cre created by someone who's seen medieval manuscripts. And so that's really going to narrow it down again to that sort of top five or 10 percent of medieval society. Um, and one of my particular favourites is the one at the bottom left here, which you might not be able to make out. And the reason for that is it's actually upside down. Now this particular inscription is about three meters up on the one of the pillars of the South Arcade. And it actually reads Wesselblythe. Now Wesselblythe was the name of the parish priest, again in the late 15th century, um, at about the same time that that arcade was being rebuilt. And what we think happened is while the stone was on the ground, um, the vicar and um, several of the other church patrons, and perhaps the church wardens, had their name inscribed into this stone, very much as a memorial to um, the rebuilding, perhaps. And then it was given to a stonemason, quite possibly an illiterate stonemason, who placed it into the pillar of the South Arcade upside down. And there it has remained ever since. Now, um, a lot of the inscriptions we come across, particularly the text inscriptions, tend to be uh, commemorative or memorial in nature. At Flamstead in Hertfordshire, there are um, three very deeply carved late 16th century inscriptions, which all seem to be um, all seem to have been created as uh, essentially memorials uh, to people who have died. So this uh, rather lovely one I'll read uh, in this middle space. At this seat's end, there lieth buried our neighbour friend, old John Grigg of Cheverell's End, anno 1598, April the 15th. Now, you can see this is exceptionally deeply carved into the pier. And when you go into Flamstead Church, it's impossible to ignore. These are one of the first things you see as you walk down the, the nave of the church. And they have uh, also all three inscriptions appear to have been created by the same individual, quite possibly, you know, parish clerk or parish priest. And so um, the um, the inference here is that these really are sort of sitting on that boundary between the formal and the informal. They've been created as sort of formal memorials, but in an informal manner. And if you actually look closely at these inscriptions, you'll see that they actually set out lines to mark out the text beforehand. So it really is sitting on that boundary between the formal and the informal. Um, Sometimes you get really quite unusual commemorative inscriptions in that you can tie it down to a very particular individual. This is from the Tower of London, and it is actually a rebus inscription um, to an individual called Thomas A. Bell. Um, so there you have a bell inscribed with the letter A. 
Now, we know Thomas Abel was a Catholic priest who refused to accept the act of supremacy under Henry VIII. And he was arrested, he was arrested and imprisoned in the Tower in 1533. And that appears to be when he created this particular inscription. He was released a few weeks later, but he was subsequently rearrested. And finally, he was executed at Smithfield in 1540. So even though he didn't know it in 1553, Thomas Abel was in fact carving his own memorial into the walls of the tower. Um, and it's not just lives which are commemorated on the walls. It can also be events, um, great events and small events. Um, at Alphamstone Church in Essex in the late 16th century, um, you had the rector there, Nicholas Le Grice, who carried out a number of works on the building. And every time he carried out these works, he liked to leave a written record. But instead of leaving a formal plaque, as you might today, he actually inscribed the stones of his own church. So this reads, um, this chancel was repaired with new timber, <laughs> with new timber work by me, Nicholas Le Grice, um, Parson, anno 1578. Now Nicholas has actually left lots of tiny inscriptions all across the chancel, and he clearly wanted to commemorate his own time there, but also make sure that people knew that he, had, he was the one that was paying for all the good works. So it's not just a commemoration, it's also in some ways a little bit of self-advertising going on there. And sometimes it's slightly larger events being commemorated. This is from uh, Lydgate Church in Suffolk, and it reads TS, 18th of January, 1583, Anno Elizabeth Viniente Sext, muster at this town. Now, this is particularly interesting because it's taking place in the years leading up to the Spanish Armada, and TS stands for Thomas Smythe, who very helpfully left his full name a few inches below this inscription. Now, Thomas Smythe was the muster master for um, this part of Essex and South Suffolk. And the muster he's referring to is a gathering together of all the men of military age in the immediate area so that they can be trained in case of invasion. Now, what's particularly interesting about this inscription is it is the only record we have of this event taking place. It simply doesn't turn up anywhere else in the written record. So in some cases, the graffiti inscriptions can add details that we simply can't find from other sources. Now, slightly um, different type of commemorative inscription and perhaps more relevant. Um, there are a particular type of inscription that we've come across in a few sites, which are memorials to plagues or pestilences, great pandemics that shook the world. And it appears that um, for the medieval population, when, that when they suffered from a plague or a pandemic, um, they really wanted to commemorate it. You know, their world was falling apart. Um, the world was never quite going to be the same again. And um, so they felt the need to uh, memorialize these events. And um, rather than leaving it to the vagaries of parchment or paper, they decide uh, to inscribe the walls of their very own parish church. They're really sort of permanently leaving this record here. This is perhaps one of the most famous of these inscriptions. This is from Ashwell Church in Hertfordshire, uh, which is absolutely covered in graffiti inscriptions. And this doesn't just commemorate one event, but two. And it says, um, or it reads, there was a plague, 1,000, three times 100, three times 10. A pitiable, fierce, violent, plague departed. A wretched populace survives to witness and in the end, a mighty wind, Maris, thunders in the year of the world, 1361. So this inscription is actually commemorating the Black Death from 1349 to 50, but also a great storm that took place just over a decade later. The storm was so great, it toppled church towers locally. And um, they obviously, again, felt that in the years after the Black Death, this was another great event that they needed to inscribe here. Now, the Ashwell inscription isn't unique. And um, we have another inscription, which is actually at, um, relatively recently uncovered in St. Edmund's Church in Acle in Norfolk. And this has actually been written on, in charcoal onto the walls of the chancel. 
we're not exactly sure which plague this refers to, and it may well be slightly later than the Black Death, um, but it reads, O lamentable death, how many dost thou cast into the pit? Anon the infants fade away, and of the aged death makes an end. Now these, now those, thou ravagest, O death, on every side. Those that wear horns or veils, fate spareth not. Therefore, while in the world the brute beast plague rages hour by hour, with prayer and with remembrance deplore death's deadliness. So what they're saying there quite simply is that this plague came and it respected no one. It took the young, it took the old, it took the good, it took the sinners, it took the saints, all of them. Fate spareth not. Can you imagine how bad things must be to actually want to inscribe the walls? Oh yeah, we can. So um, text inscriptions, they tend to make up, as I said, a fairly small percentage. The ones I have shown you as well tend to be some of the better ones. Um, text inscriptions can be really quite frustrating because when someone has written something on the wall, the urge is, of course, to read it. And a lot of the text inscriptions we come across simply can't be read. Now, there are several reasons for that. Uh, in some cases, as you can see with this inscription from Swannington in Norfolk, um, if you look at the left hand side, the text has been so heavily abraded, you simply can't make it out anymore. Um, in other cases, the, um, a lot of these inscriptions are in Latin, um, but certainly not the sort of Latin that you would uh, learn at school. A lot of it is clerical Latin or dog Latin. So they're full of abbreviations, they're full of contractions. This particular inscription, you can just make out we have letter semper in there, so it probably relates to elite court taking place somewhere in the church. But any more than that, we really can't make out. Some of these contractions and some of the, uh, the letter forms are so difficult um, that the joke among some of the archivists was the only person who could possibly ever read these inscriptions was the person who wrote them. Now, other things we come across moving aside from text for a while, well, um, faces, lots and lots of faces. Amongst the graffiti hunters, there is a bit of a joke that if you uh, stare at the walls for long enough, you'll soon find them staring back. And it's not too far from the truth. Um, there's a whole collection here. The one on the left, one of my particular favourites, is from Skoll, just on the Norfolk Suffolk border. And um, this rather bearded, rather rather toothy grin, um, it has been suggested that this represents a local bishop, perhaps. It's certainly not the most flattering of portraits. Um, this inscription is from uh, Norwich Castle Keep, and it appears to show the head of a 14th century woman wearing a butterfly headdress. Now, of particular interest here, you'll note that the face has been discolored. It's a, it's a much browner, darker color than the surrounding stonework. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, this inscription is it's located at about shoulder height uh, as you walk through one of the old main entrances to the keep. And above it are a couple of windows which shed light over this area at certain times of day. So they create a sort of natural raking light effect. So for centuries, people have walked into the uh, Norwich Castle keep, looked around, and they've seen this face of a woman and they've immediately put out their hand and they've touched it. So all that discoloration you're seeing on her face is caused by the oil and the grime in your fingertips. It's caused by centuries of people actually going out and touching this inscription. So one of the rules amongst the graffiti hunters, one of the rules amongst those archeologists who record these is look, but don't touch. If you start touching the inscriptions, eventually they will all end up looking like this poor woman from Norwich Castle. Other things we come across, well, um, a lot of animals, uh, a lot of birds, a lot of, um, well, occasional fish, uh, unless you happen to be in Eastbourne. And um, really the walls are covered with an entire menagerie. What's particularly interesting is the animals we aren't seeing. So we're finding the deer, we're finding the running hounds, we're finding the hunting hawks. 
What we're not seeing are the everyday animals of the farmyard. So we're not finding really the pigs, we're not finding the sheep, we're not finding the cattle, and even the horses we're coming across are definitely sort of the, uh, the nightly charger rather than the plow horse. Now, obviously, this is an area for you know, future research, but it does appear that there's almost an aspirational nature to a lot of these graffiti inscriptions. Um, the one thing we really aren't getting too many of are the fantastic beasts. Um, a lot of people have compared graffiti inscriptions in the past to the marginalia that you find on medieval manuscripts, you know, the jousting snails, the monkeys throwing their own feces, the dragons, that kind of thing. And it's simply, um, when you get down to the detail, it simply isn't the case. We do find the occasional fantastic beasts, such as this rather wonderful example from Finchingfield, um, but they are few and far between. I can count them really on the fingers of both hands. So it seems that the relationship is much more with reality um, than it is with our um, myths and fantasies. Um, one of the other things we come across a lot, of course, is heraldry. There's an awful large, well, lo very large number of heraldic inscriptions all across our churches and cathedrals. Now, these can um, vary from the very, very sort of stylized examples, as you see at top left, right down to, uh, you know, exceptionally detailed examples, as you see there from Troston at the top right. However, we still have a bit of a fundamental problem with a lot of our heraldic inscriptions. And that is that it's exceptionally difficult to tie down any individual heraldic inscription with an individual person, or even in some cases, an individual family. And the reason for that isn't that, you know, the inscriptions are so bad, um, even detailed ones like that at the top right. Um, you know, the one thing they are missing and the one thing that heraldry relies upon is of course, color, pigment and it's what we don't get in the graffiti inscriptions. So that particular coat of arms at top right um, could in diff various different color forms belong to any, well, any number of up to about half a dozen families, um, none of whom uh, appear to have had any clean and uh, common association with the parish of Troston. So again, heraldic graffiti is certainly an area for further research and it's certainly posing quite a few problems. Um, other things we come across occasionally, well, buildings. But again, it's a bit like the animal inscriptions. We come across um, windmills. We come across depictions even of castles. We come across quite a few depictions of churches. What we're not finding, particularly within the church and cathedral graffiti, is depictions of vernacular architecture. We're not finding people depicting their own houses, um, not you know, the places they live. We're not even finding them depicting the local manor houses. So um, it really is, you know, we're seeing some buildings depicted, but other ones are entirely absent from the record. Now, what you have to remember, of course, in the case of something like windmills is that it's a relatively new technology in the Middle Ages. So perhaps there is a kind of a novel or an, you know, a novelty to it or some form of innovation. But, um, you know, we are seeing very specific groupings and very specific absences. And with all graffiti inscriptions, sometimes it's what's not there that's as important as what is there. Now, one of the rarest types of graffiti we come across is musical notation. And we have two wonderful examples here. The top one is from Norwich Cathedral. And that at uh, the bottom, um, very, very beautifully executed, is from Horning Church out in the Broads in Norfolk. Now, as I say, musical notation really is one of the rarest types. And it does normally tend to be associated with our larger buildings. So our cathedrals, our abbeys, our priories, places like that. Now, it doesn't mean that music wasn't, um, you know, incredibly important in the local parish church, but what it does mean is that musical notation really wasn't being taught at that level. It's only in these larger institutions, um, you know, such as your cathedrals, um, where you actually have formal musical educa education taking place, and that's really kind of reflected on the walls. 
Sometimes, though, in the parish church, you know, um, we do get indications that music is present. These two rather wonderful figures are from Stoke by Clare um, down into Suffolk. And all of the little figures um, spaced around the church appear to represent either musicians or people singing. So it's clear that music was incredibly important down at that parish level. It's simply they weren't writing the music on the walls. Oh, it has been suggested as well um, that these are all created by the same individual in Stoke by Clare Church. Um, the only evidence for that appears to be they're wearing the same hat. Uh, and sometimes, of course, we find inscriptions related to those people who were actually building these churches. Um, architectural inscriptions are really quite rare. Um, when we began the surveys, there were really uh, less than about 25 of these known anywhere in England. We have more than tripled that number over the last decade, and we are really learning a great deal from them about medieval construction techniques and, medi and the medieval design process. This tiny inscription, it's only about 140 millimetres across, is from one of, well, it's one of three inscriptions from Western Longville Church just outside Norwich. And rather than being a full design, this appears to be very much Mason schematic. He's working out the um, first principles of the tracery for a window which still appears to survive on the south side of the chancel to this day. Now, one of my favorite types of um, graffiti is ship graffiti, um, such as this rather lovely example of a single masted late medieval vessel from Norwich Cathedral. This is exactly the sort of thing you would have seen sailing around the coastline of England in the late medieval period. Now, ship graffiti um, really well, when we began the survey, um, we believed it was concentrated on um, the coastal areas. And the reason for that is essentially that's where we were looking. So um, churches like Winchelsea, churches like Cly, churches um, you know, down in places like Dover and Southampton were all full of images of ships. However, as we've started to look further afield, we're also finding ship graffiti. In fact, we're finding it as far inland as places like, you know, Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, you know, you can't get further from the sea. Now, all of these vessels as well are seagoing vessels, and most of them appear to be depicted in pretty much the same way. So um, they're usually shown with um, sails furled. Um, they're shown in profile. Um, and as you see at top left there, they're normally shown with an anchor as well. Um, so they appear to be sort of a ship at rest, as it were. And it has been suggested, and it's, um, there's some pretty strong evidence that these uh, little depictions of ships are actually related to votive uh, offerings, ex voto offerings. Um, so that each one of these ships represents a, a prayer or an offering to the church. Um, they are quite literally prayers made solid in stone. But we don't stop with the graffiti. We do tend to record just about everything. Um, so we'll record the, the merchant's marks, we'll record the mason's marks, we'll record any marking on the surface. Um, merchant's marks are really quite common across all of our medieval churches and cathedrals. For those of you who haven't come across them before, a merchant's mark is almost the, um, well you can think of it as the logo of the Middle Ages. Um, the general idea is that every merchant had his own individual mark and he would use that to mark his goods, he would use that to sign documents. Um, if he really did well for himself he might use it as you know, on his memorial brass or something of that nature. It's been described as poor man's heraldry. And the idea behind it is that anyone could look at that mark, say, you know, take the one at the top left and go, oh, that's John Smith of Blakeney or whatever. Um, and they would recognise it whether they were literate or illiterate. It is slightly more complex than that. And we are fairly sure now that we are seeing uh, not just merchants marks, but we're also seeing guild marks on the walls of our churches. So some of our merchant guilds, but also some of our religious guilds as well. So um, the story that we started with has now become uh, more complex as we've moved onwards. And of course, we also record Mason's marks. Now the Mason's marks are the earliest mark you're gonna find on any church or cathedral. Um, these were made by the guys who were actually building 
these churches. Again, the traditional story is that each um, individual mason had their own mark and they would use it to mark the stones that they had finished. And then at the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the project, the master mason would come around and work out exactly how much he had to pay each of the individual masons. Well, again, this is a story that's really sort of evolved well beyond there now. So we no longer quite believe that because you can go into some churches and it's absolutely covered in Mason's marks, but they're all the same one. And other um, churches where we only get certain areas where we have Mason's marks or we have a, you know, a wide variety. So we think there's, there's really um, a sort of a quality control element going on now as well. And um, we also get lots of different types of Mason's marks, of course. We get banker Masons for those who are roughing out the stones. We get walling Masons who are often being paid by the yard anyway, so don't even need to leave their mark. And then we get fine Masons and, of course, the master Mason himself. So really, um, the, uh, the research in this is still you know, ongoing, but the more we record, the more we understand. And we do tend to record everything. Uh, we tend to take an archaeological approach, uh, approach to all our recording. So that means we record all of the markings on the stone, even when, as here, they clearly aren't um, yeah, that historically significant. Although if Blackadder really was there at Bodium Castle, I would be impressed. And I'm fairly sure that King Alfred didn't have access to a pencil. Um, but the idea is by recording everything, we're creating a baseline survey. So in the years to come, we'll be able to see if anything has been lost or um, quite possibly added to as well. So the rule is it doesn't matter how old it is, if it was made in the 12th century or 12 weeks ago, we record everything. And of course, a lot of the graffiti <laughs> isn't that good. Um, some of the examples I've shown you here are, you know, exceptionally lovely, are wonderful ships and some of the um, you know, beautiful compass drawn designs. Um, but a lot of it is really fairly crude. As this example from Marsham in Norfolk, um, it appears to sort of show a rather crude depiction of St. George and the dragon. And uh, if you look at the dragon figure on the right, there appears to be a fringe at the bottom, which would suggest that this may be an individual wearing a costume of some sort. So perhaps this is a very crude depiction of some sort of mummer's play that was um, taking place in the in the church. But it doesn't matter how crude or um, how uh, modern the inscriptions are, we do tend to record everything. Now, the one question I always get asked is how do we date these graffiti inscriptions? Well, um, there are a variety of uh, methods. In the first instance, it really helps if they've left a date, as Thomas Ridgewell did here in 1508 at Wood Ditton in Cambridgeshire. Um, but dated graffiti is really quite rare. Um, Pre-Reformation dated graffiti is, well, I can probably count the examples on the fingers of one hand. And in most cases, as the example here from uh, Parham in Suffolk, um, which dates back to 1437, they do seem to be uh, associated with building and construction work. So they're almost commemorating those events. In general, people don't start dating graffiti until the early period of the 16th century. And it doesn't become commonplace until the early 17th century. Now, there are several possible reasons for that. Um, one is that prior to the 16th century, a lot of the dating in documents and elsewhere was being done by regnal year um, rather than by calendar year. So what I mean by that is that they are dating the year by um, the year of the reign of the king or queen. So you know the 19th year of the reign of Henry VIII, that kind of thing, um, which tends to be rather laboriously, uh, rather laborious to inscribe that into the wall. And the other thing, of course, is that most of the, or a lot of the pre-Reformation inscriptions we're finding in churches and cathedrals tend to be devotional in nature. Um, they are quite simply prayers and you don't need to date a prayer. So, as I say, these um, early and dated inscriptions are very rare. So we have to rely on a whole series of other factors to date inscriptions. 
Um, examples such as this uh, one from Bennington in Lincolnshire. Um, this is a holy monogram, IHS. And that last letter there, it looks like the letter C, but it's what we call the long medieval S. Now that really goes out of use in the, well, in uh, anywhere between about 1500 and 1550 in terms of the average sort of manuscript. So we can say from the, the fact that they're still using a long S here, um, that this predates about 1550. Um, in other cases, we have to use different methods to uh, date the inscriptions, um, such as if we're looking at figures, we could look at the costume, um, such as the rather wonderful 17th century, early 17th century figure from Norwich Castle Keep, uh, waving his big sword above his head. Um, or the example here with the uh, the, the crowned head from Gamlingay uh, down in Cambridgeshire. So sometimes you really have to you know, go on the, the style of costume or in the case of ship graffiti on the construction details so it really is a wide variety and in some cases we actually have to fall back on the construction history of the church itself so this example of a compass drawn design here you can see is from Finchingfield in Essex and it is peering out from behind um, the a, a a uh, rude screen or a park closed screen. We know that screen is inserted in the late 15th century. And we know that the wall um, dates to about a century earlier. So the fact that this compass drawn design is obscured by the screen um, means that it was built sometime between the wall being built um, and the screen being inserted. So that really gives us um, you know, a, a whole century to look at. Now, for some historians, being able to pin something down to a mere century, that may seem as though we, we aren't being terribly ambitious here. But when it comes to the graffiti inscription, sometimes the best you can say is, you know, probably pre-Reformation or post-Reformation. So pinning something down to a century, as far as we're concerned, is really rather good. Now, what you also have to remember is that this is an evolving archive. Um, as we go out and we look at more sites, of course, we are recording more graffiti inscriptions. Um, but also as these sites are changing and we're starting to see uh, more inscriptions appear. So this rather lovely um, six petal rosette is from uh, Litcham Church in central Norfolk. And as you can see, it is emerging out from beneath the layers of lime wash, which are gradually peeling away from the wall. And that can be used also, um, going back to the previous point, for dating. Um, we know the piers of Litcham Church were built and um, they were uh, built in 1412. Um, we actually have uh, the written record that they were consecrated on St Botolph's Day in 1412. And we know that the first layers of lime wash were applied to the church in the middle of the 16th century um, at the time of the English Reformation. So this little six petal rosette must have been created at some point between 1412 and about 1547. So again, that's giving us quite a tight archeological time frame. And as all these layers of lime wash peel off, new inscriptions are emerging. So even churches that we've surveyed once, if we go back again, we can often find that where deterioration has taken place of the surface, we're coming across new inscriptions but it's not always good news. Um, this is from Troston Church in Suffolk again. And the figure on the left was recorded in 2010. Um, it's on the tower arch on the north side. Uh, in the last few years, they've had a problem with the church where water has been able to get in and the water ingress has caused what we call delamination of the stonework. Literally, the damp pushes the layers of the soft stone apart and eventually it will just fall off the wall. And as you can see now, all that's left of this original inscription on the left is the legs. And when I was there in 2019, back in the days when we were still allowed out, um, I was literally picking up pieces of the graffiti from the floor. So a lot of the recording of graffiti inscriptions we're doing is a race against the clock. Um, more will emerge, but more is being lost every week. So lastly, how is the study of uh, medieval graffiti inscriptions in English churches changing our perceptions on how these spaces were used and the people who used them? Well, 
What you have to remember that is that most of the images I've shown you have been what we call reworked images. And um, as you'll see from this rather lovely example of ship graffiti from Wiverton Church on the Norfolk coast, all those black lines have been added in on the computer afterwards. If you went to the church today, you wouldn't see this. What we have to do is we go in and we shine very powerful lights obliquely right across the surface of the walls and as we do it highlights any marking on the wall but as soon as we turn those lights off many of these inscriptions just disappear in some respects it might be what's protected them for centuries people simply didn't realize they were there um, so today these inscriptions are really really difficult to see however that wasn't the case when they were first made what you have to remember is that virtually every church and cathedral during the Middle Ages was brightly coloured. Today we tend to think of them as being, you know, lime washed and fairly plain. But in the Middle Ages, um, they would be absolutely a riot of colour with medieval wall paintings, geometrical patterns. Um, this is from the, uh, the reconstructed St. Tilo's Church at the Welsh National Folk Museum. And what they did here is when they reconstructed the church, um, they decided they would paint the inside to look pretty much how they think it would have looked during the Middle Ages. Anyone who knows their medieval wall paintings will also see where they've taken some of the designs from. And as you can see, it's very different from the plain whitewashed box that we tend to think of as the English church today. Now, bright that this is, I really don't think personally they've gone far enough. Um, those lower levels of the walls, uh, you can see they've left as plain lime wash. Now, in many cases, we know that this didn't happen. Those areas were color washed too. They may not have bright images of saints or dragons or even Noah's Ark, but they were often painted a plain flat color. If you go to churches like Western Longville, um, where they've got a bit of a damp problem, you can actually see these layers literally peeling off the wall. And you've got blacks, you've got dark reds, you've got oranges, you've got yellow ochres. And it's in these areas, these plain areas down at the base of these pillars, that many of the graffiti inscriptions are actually cut. So they're actually cut through this pigment, as we see from these examples, which are still extant at Siena Cathedral, to reveal the pale plaster beneath. And as you can see, they absolutely stand out. So far from being hidden away, far from being, um, you know, created in dark corners, these would have been one of the most obvious things you saw when you walked into a medieval English church. You know, forget the stained glass, forget the alabaster monuments. Um, everywhere you looked around you, you would be seeing a mass of graffiti inscriptions, a mass of devotional inscriptions. Now, think about the implications of that. At any point, had these been looked upon as vandalism, had these been looked upon as destructive, then at any point the vicar or the church wardens could have come across, could have come along and whitewashed them over. They could have painted over them. They didn't. And the reason we know they didn't is because they're still there to be seen today at places wherever you find medieval wall paintings. And that tells us that these inscriptions, these graffiti inscriptions, were both accepted and acceptable. Now, if you'd like to know any more about medieval graffiti, and in particular some of the interpretation, I can suggest you take a look at our website, which is www.medieval-graffiti.uk, or you can follow me on Twitter at Medieval G. Many thanks for listening.